Warm welcome to COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. My name is Caitlin Wee and I'm a second year medical student at NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. This webinar is the seventh in a series of 12 presented by NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University Health System and Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network. This weekly webinar series will provide viewpoints and insights from a panel of leading experts in infectious diseases and related specialties and disciplines. I'm pleased to introduce you to our moderator, who is also the program director of the series. Recruited to establish an infectious disease training program in Singapore, he was the first infectious diseases head of department at the Communicable Disease Center here in 1992. He is also a visiting senior fellow of the Courage Fund at the university. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Allen. Thank you, Caitlin. Welcome to the seventh installment of our 12-part webinar, COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. We hope the broadcast continues to find you and your loved ones safe and well. The focus of tonight's episode is around the world in 80 days. What has the world learned since the joint WHO-China mission on COVID-19? Our guest expert this week to help answer that question is Dr. Bruce Aylward, whom I'll formally introduce after Dale's epidemiology update. We will be changing our format this week. Dale will start us off with an update of regional and international COVID-19 epidemiology, as usual. Following that, Dr. Aylward will give opening comments on this evening's topic. Bruce and uh, Dale on, uh, will uh, respond to pre-submitted questions for an in-depth discussion period, and we will get to as many of your questions as possible. After the uh, question and answer period, I'll summarize the evening's key points and preview next week's guest expert. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Dale Fisher. He's Professor of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, Senior Consultant, Division of Infectious Disease at National University Hospital, and Chair of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, hosted by World Health Organization. Dale, over to you. Thanks, David. Just let me share my screen. So thanks everyone. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to this show. It's uh, like we're getting the band back together with, with, uh, with Bruce and I, I believe some of the others online. Uh, so I'll just take you through the uh, weekly epidemiologic changes. Uh, not much from, from this uh, Johns Hopkins University dashboard. 14th of May to the 21st of May. So in the last week, we've gone up the usual 600,000 cases per week uh, and around 30 something thousand deaths. So that's 
contributing to this ongoing R naught of one curve globally, uh, very flat curve with, with the odd probably uh, reporting anomaly along the way. Here it is by, by, by WHO region, each completely different shapes for, for different reasons, which I will come to. Wipro, we've taken China and the reporting anomalies out. This uh, presents a lot better. So this is actually the Western Pacific area, excluding China, which is obviously having very few cases at the, at the moment. Uh, and you can see pretty good ascertainment across the region because this black line of the deaths being so much uh, less. So we've got less than 50 deaths most days, but, uh, but number of cases over a thousand uh, e each day. This little hump here was the first Korean hump. And you'll see with, uh, with around say a thousand cases a day uh, as an average, if you like, uh, you'll see that a lot of that is, is being contributed to uh, by Singapore, you can see in the last week there's been 4,000 cases, and and that increment is is uh, amongst the highest of the of the most affected countries. You can have a look down there, but but obviously, this is uh, this is in a, in a setting of most of these countries having significant lockdowns. So so it'll be interesting to see how these pan out over the next weeks and months. Uh, I received this from a, a colleague in South Korea when I asked how the the nightclub outbreak was was going, and uh, thanks uh, MD for for sharing these. You can see the the blue bars are those people that visited the clubs. Uh, red bars were the were close contacts of those. So you've got like two 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 epi curves. The the blue one and 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 a generation later was the the close contacts. Uh, the thing that I find striking, we did get into um, four generations of, of cases. So. So in such a short space of time, but we know that about the virus now. But look at this one, 60,000 tests done over this, uh, over this period of, of what's about 10 days. So, so I tell you, when it comes to, uh, to, to, to test, 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 I think Korea takes the cake. And that's, uh, that was also shown in the, in the Daegu uh, outbreak. So, so well done for, for allowing this to be 187 clubs, which were 93 from the clubs and and uh, 94 close contacts and not letting that become uh, four, four digits. Uh, as we go, so this is uh, Wipro, so you can see Singapore here, uh, Japan coming down, but a lot of deaths, remarkably few deaths in Singapore. We'll come back to that in a minute. In a minute, here's Philippines, South Korea uh, and the Australian chart. Uh, Ciaro, a, 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 different, uh, a, a different chart. Um, still got uh, increasing numbers, 7,000 cases in the region per day. And this is being largely driven by India, Bangladesh, Indonesia. But look, look at, uh, so India is having uh, over 30,000 cases a day uh, diagnosed by the lab. And, uh, and what this, what this, th this is in a setting of, of semi-lockdown. Uh, and I think they had uh, an even bigger tally today, which, uh, which I, I gather is, creating some unrest about undoing some of the, uh, the social restrictions. Um, and and here's, here's these charts. So, so India still going up, Bangladesh on the way up, Indonesia, uh, Thailand coming down after all their lockdowns and curfews. Uh, Euro, uh, as I mentioned, this, this uh, is coming down. It would be much steeper, but you can see where the black line is compared to the, the number of cases. So this, this really tells us there's been under ascertainment, so so roughly one to to four thousand deaths uh, per day and and forty thousand cases. So um, this would be steeper if not for Russia, which you can see is really pushing this along with uh, with about sixty thousand of the cases or ten thousand cases a day, uh, and UK still seeing significant activity, but uh, most of the other European countries uh, now now really. Uh, <clears throat> under control and coming out of lockdown. Germany's got soccer happening again. And here's what, uh, what these charts all look like. Spain, very steep. I'm sure we'll hear more about that tonight. Germany, Italy, but, but Russia, uh, Russia only just starting to turn the corner now. Eastern Mediterranean is, is very fascinating. That's the, the overall situation, uh, but it's, it's very even uh, across the countries. Iran, Saudi Arabia, all seeing uh, double-digit uh, percentage increases in, in cases. 
but look at this. Uh, so Iran, uh, a little bit more conventional, I, I guess, of, 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 uh, of relationships between death and cases, but Saudi Arabia down here, Qatar down here, UAE, Kuwait, and it looks a lot like Singapore, yes, and these are all uh, being affected by, by foreign worker dormitory outbreaks. So we're seeing that same sort of low case fatality rate. Uh, Pan, Pan American health region, uh, Brazil is the talking point here, 90,000 cases uh, in the last week there. So US flattening out a little bit. Um, so lots of, lots of places here to, to watch the space really. Um, and, and there's the curves, you can have a, have a quick look for those. Each, each country has a story in itself and, and as does each, each part of the country. Africa, I had a nice, uh, read a nice article from, uh, from Chikwe, um, from Nigeria CDC recently, and uh, lots of optimism. They're very pleased with the, the testing capacity that's been built and, and a lot of the, uh, the uh, opportunities to, to address the, the outbreak as it, as it hits African countries. Uh, and there you can see the, the spread of the African countries and how they're being, um, being uh, hit by this. Still a handful of countries that haven't uh, haven't seen the virus, um, but uh, but generally uh, many sort of Pacific islands and things like that, and North Korea. So moving to Singapore, we know the the dormitory outbreak uh, is this blue one here. So you can see that remains pretty flat. But I can tell you from the from the from the field that almost all of the the dormitories we are feeling that the number of ARIs presenting is coming down. Uh, so there, there is light at the end of the tunnel there and, and strategies being put in place to, to try and uh, bring at least some workers out uh, to, to get our economy moving again. But uh, it's being done in a setting of, uh, of really uh, close attention, especially to, to the older workers, which sadly for, for all of us on the panel is, is regarded as over 45. Community cases are, are right down single digit, except for today where there were some, uh, some sweeps, so a slightly larger number of cases, but, but by and large, this is, is, uh, is under control. And this is probably one of the most important epi curves we need to watch, which is these unlinked cases. And, and even now with all the, the, the restrictions in place, uh, there are still unlinked cases. Now about half of these end up linked, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, the, these are what really drive the outbreak and, and are really why we'll never uh, be free of social restrictions. Uh, and, and this is another story. So you look at the, the black line, they, these are deaths. So we're at, uh, what's that, 22, 23. It's uh, really quite uh, unexpected, I guess, a, a pleasant surprise that despite all these cases we're having, uh, we're just not seeing them come through to, to ICU and, and dying and look, <clears throat> In the country, there's only 11 ICU beds with COVID patients. So, so this is uh, excellent information that you can find on the MOH website. Uh, Google mobility data, uh, people, at least as of May 13, this was the latest version I could get. You can, people are still by and large uh, behaving, uh, less rec retail, recreation, parks, transit stations, workplaces, uh, and people staying home. So. So this is quite quite nice way to to check. And finally, just if you thought you were short of good news, here's some more um, lockdowns and and circuit breakers don't only stop um, uh, COVID. Here's our conjunctivitis rates for the year: the red bars, the blue bars are last year. So you can see since the since the circuit breaker, uh, really the number of conjunctivitis has come down, diarrheal illness has come down hand, foot and mouth diseases down, uh, uh, polyclinic attendances for all acute respiratory infections are down. And what happens when you stay home? It looks like you get dengue. So um, it was obviously happening right from the beginning of the year because we, um, but uh, nonetheless, that's, that's the only uh, uh, disease, infectious disease being monitored routinely uh, that, that seems to have taken a, a, a hit up. So on that note, David, I'll pass back to you and the rest of the show. Thanks. Great, great, Dale. Thank you very much. Uh, you just can't win. It's either ARI or dinghy. 
It gives me great pleasure uh, now to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Bruce uh, Aylward. He's a senior advisor on organizational change to the Director General. Dr. Aylward uh, headed the joint WHO-China mission on COVID-19 from February 16 to 24 this year, in which Professor Fisher was also a delegate. Bruce has over 30 years of outbreak control and disease eradication around the world. Bruce? Good afternoon, good morning, and I understand good evening even for many of the people on the calls. David, thank you for the uh, hello and for the welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me uh, and, and the role I've been playing in COVID, um, my, my, my background, as David mentioned, is about 30 years of working in, um, in infectious disease eradication, elimination control programs. And um, I've had one of these uh, 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 incredibly uh, uh, blessed careers, let's say, in that I've been able to work at the community level, the country level, the regional level with WHO and the HQ level. So I've, I've seen uh, these diseases, these programs across quite a spectrum. And then also I've worked across uh, outbreaks such as Zika, of course. Uh, I led, led that response for WHO and the UN and then the Ebola response in West Africa, uh, as well as polio and other diseases before that. Um, in the COVID outbreak, David, just maybe for the for the those um, um, who are on the call, so they'll have a little bit of the sense of a perspective I'll bring to any comments I might make to hopefully the very easy questions you'll ask me. Um, the uh, the role I've been playing really has been uh, twofold. I'm about to shift roles as we go forward, but. Um, because of the background that I have, I've been asked to uh, uh, support and help uh, derive learnings from a lot of the big, uh, heavily affected countries. I've been on the ground in, in, in China, of course, in Spain, uh, spent much of last week in New York, actually. And I've also been working closely with um, countries, a couple of countries in Africa, as well as the Middle East. Um, so that's one role is really uh, providing support, also deriving some of the learnings. And then here at the global level, I've spent uh, a big part of my time helping translate some of that into the global strategy and, 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 and some of the global policies that have underpinned then the global response. As we move forward, I'm going to start playing a bigger role now in helping to coordinate and head the effort on, uh, on, on the development and rollout of some of the new tools that we're looking for in the areas of vaccines, diagnostics, and, and, and uh, therapeutics. That's a little bit of background uh, who I am and, uh, and, and what I've been doing in COVID. Um, I think, David, as we get into the questions, I can talk a little bit about some of the things we've seen, as well as some of the big learnings we've derived from, from those. Thank you so much for that uh, fleshing out uh, your history. Appreciate that. Um, let's jump right to the questions. We have a lot that have been submitted, and we're going to try to work our way through. We apologize in advance. We won't get to all of them, but we'll try to hit the, the high points. Uh, what would you say would uh, be the most important findings from the February Joint uh, World Health Organization China mission? Oh, the, we're going to start with the easy ones. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, David. Well, we, at, at the end of the mission, we, lay, we laid out five big, or sorry, four big findings that I, I think resonate still today. Uh, if you take yourselves back to early February, when we were uh, asked, myself, Dale, and the international team that went in um, to work with our Chinese counterparts, um, there, were, there were three key areas that we were looking at. We needed to understand the severity of this disease. We understand, needed to understand how it was being transmitted. And we needed to understand the impact of the, uh, of the measures that China was putting in place, because all of that was going to frame the global response. But um, when we came out, we highlighted, uh, in addition, a lot of detail around those questions, really four big findings. And the first was that this was not flu and it was not SARS. It was a new disease that we needed to respect, um, uh, uh, work with, and take advantage of those elements if we were to control it. And I have to say, going into China, all I was hearing was, is this seasonal flu or is this SARS? And it was a very binary thinking that, in fact, um, threatened our ability to, to, to respond properly. So that was the first big finding, as simple as it sounds. It's not flu, it's not SARS. This is in the middle, both in terms of how it's transmitted, its transmissibility, as well as uh, uh, the, the severity and spectrum of disease. The second big finding, and, and this was probably uh, the most striking, was that the non use of non-pharmaceutical measures, good old-fashioned case finding, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, could actually change the course of a respire of an outbreak of a highly infectious 
respiratory borne disease. And remember, many of us have grown up with flu and planning for pandemic flu, which is all about how do you get your uh, vaccines developed quickly and rolled out, et cetera. So this was another striking finding that there was a lot we could do without a vaccine. The third big finding, uh, David, was we were not ready, despite so many years of pandemic planning and preparedness. We were not ready uh, in mindsets or materially to deal with this new disease. This is another big finding coming out of there. And that the time we were buying through these big lockdowns in China, et cetera, needed to be used much more effectively. So those were the big findings. And then we had really specific findings around severity, transmissibility, and we'll come to those perhaps as we go forward and what we've learned since. We're now 80 days since that uh, China mission. Uh, the report issued has accurately predicted disease severity. <clears throat> transmission and the interventions required. Is there anything else that has, or is there anything that has not turned out as expected? Well, and I think it'd be helpful also, Dale, maybe you'll share a few reflections in this area. But, you know, David, if I think of each of those big three areas, um, we were uh, uh, fundamentally right about some of the basics, but we've learned additional things that if we don't grab and take advantage of, we're not going to tackle this disease as efficiently, effectively, and save as many lives as, as we might. So first, if we look in the area of disease severity, um, we, we did get it about right in terms of you know, case fatality rates, uh, et, et cetera. And in terms of the spectrum of disease, we have a pretty good fix. However, if you look at some of the things we've learned since, um, first of all, is in the area of, um, of, uh, of uh, the spectrum of disease. We're now seeing this Kawasaki-like syndrome in children, for example, um, in the U.S. in particular. And it's about one in 100 kids there that are getting hit with that. That is something we hadn't seen, and it's extremely important in terms of this disease. We're also learning a lot more about the underlying clotting diseases and, and hypercoagulability associated with it. Even when we were in China, however, it was interesting. The Chinese physicians would say to us that this is not just a lung disease. This affects much more. They had a sense of that, but now we're getting a much better sense of how it affects the heart, how it affects other organs. So I think we're coming to understand a lot more about the spectrum of the disease and the severity of this disease in certain subpopulations, which we didn't have a, a full grip on uh, in, in, in China um, at that time. And if you think about the area of uh, transmissibility, a lot of the things that we learned at that time about congregate settings, you know, between uh, uh, adult populations, the main drivers, a lot of household uh, transmission driving it at the time, a lot of that has played out in other settings as well. But there's a few other things even there that we uh, look a little bit different. When we were in China, we spent a lot of time trying to understand how much asymptomatic disease there was, because that was going to be really important in understanding transmission dynamics as well. And um, Dale, I remember we looked in, in, in many places, every kind of place, David, where they had like surveyed a whole hospital or swabbed a whole hospital to try and figure out how many people um, actually had infection, how many of those were symptomatic, how many were pre-symptomatic versus truly asymptomatic. And it really seemed to us that this was a very low number, well under 10%. That was part of the reason we said, look, it's not a big uh, driver of, of transmissibility. But it does seem now that we are dealing with probably a higher proportion of asymptomatics. And that's going to be really important as we go forward. But David, on that point, I would highlight to people, there are, is such things as asymptomatic cases in this disease, without a doubt. However, there aren't asymptomatic transmission chains. And you have to think about this in terms of chains of transmission and interrupting those. And you know, people say, well, asymptomatic disease, what can we do and throw their hands up, right? You can still tackle this. Um, it's just like way back when Singapore did some really important work showing, look, there is pre-symptomatic shedding of this disease and people would throw their hands up. And no, you just extend your period that you look for contacts. So um, that was another important difference. And in the control measures, I think, if anything, the basic lessons of China have been so much more strongly reaffirmed. We've seen so many countries, their go-to uh, uh, maneuver on, on, on COVID has been lockdowns, locking down their populations. And even as they're coming out of lockdown, they have not put in place that basic testing case finding and isolation, contact tracing, you know, quarantine and tracing. And you know, for, for me, this is, 
the single biggest difference I'm seeing from the response in the East, uh, where you are in Singapore and other countries in the East, and what I'm seeing in the West, even as lockdowns are getting raised, the contact tracing capacities aren't in place, the case isolation capacities aren't in place. And, uh, you know, one of the things I used to say to Dale, <laughs> you know, we used to talk about is, you know, with this virus, we use the lockdowns to get our foot on the neck of the virus. And as we take our foot off the neck of the virus, we got to get our hands around its throat, right, with our case isolation and contact tracing. And um, and you got to squeeze real tight if you're going to want to keep this thing under control. So those are a few reflections on how um, I, I think the fundamentals have been right, but we've learned more about the spectrum of the disease, the severity of the disease in some subpopulations, some of the nuance about how it's transmitting. And we have to take advantage of every single piece of that to control this disease. But, you know, David, last point I would make on this, we have learned this disease can be before we get our vaccines, therapeutics that we're gunning for, but we're not doing enough of the fundamentals um, in enough settings to achieve that. Great. Um, so just to expand on that. That was a big question. Uh, no, no, no. Smarter on our others. But that was a big question. Two months with a new disease. That's a lifetime. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate the perspective. I'm, I'm curious, uh, from your perspective, since you have traveled all over the world dealing with COVID-19, do you think it's a different disease in New York than it is in, in, in let's say, Thailand or Vietnam? Are you seeing the spectrum? Um, no, I, I I don't actually. I think we're um, I think it would be premature to say that. Let, let let's say, but I I think fundamentally we're dealing with a a similar disease. You know, New York. There's some things that are really stunning about the outbreak in New York. Um, if you look at the serologic data, it's just coming out now. Twenty two percent of New Yorkers in the Manhattan in the city um, and and the boroughs around the city have got antibody. Twenty two percent. And if you look at the statewide, it's about 10%. So that is some ferocious rates of, uh, of infection and transmission and probably large viral loads people were being exposed to as well. And uh, given that, I think I'd be cautious to say what we're seeing there is different than in, in other places. I think we're dealing with a particularly intense mm -hmm. transmission that may, um, as, as time goes forward and we learn more, explain some of the reasons that what we're seeing look different than what we're seeing elsewhere. They've got some very big numbers too, remember. 350,000 cases almost now in New York City. Uh, so a lot of cases in children. So what are rare events that we may have not picked up in other settings, the numbers are getting to a level and, you know, with a system that we're, we're actually able to see it and, and associate it with the disease rather than, you know, with, uh, you know, background rates of Kawasaki or whatever. Dale, did you want to comment on if uh, things turned out the way you uh, thought they might? Yeah, I'm interested in Jane, Dale's perspective. <laughs> I, I do recall landing there in Beijing on that Saturday when we started the mission on the Sunday. And it was remarkable that everyone in the plane suddenly put masks on. And I thought, that's very strange. Uh, within a few days, I didn't find it and strange. you didn't want to. <laughs> oh, well, I didn't, didn't want think, to. I didn't think I need to, needed to because um, there was excellent source control around me. Everyone else wore a mask. Yeah. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but actually someone offered me a mask and I've declined, but I later realized it was law, but, uh, the skies were, were perfectly blue. The, the streets were empty with rare cars and already I was starting to get a feel of, of how much this virus had brought the country to its knees. And, and that was, uh, one of the, the state, one, maybe one of the statements that, uh, that drew applause when we were writing the report. I think Bruce made the comment of the, the substantial health, social and economic impacts that this disease can have. And I keep going back to that, to that triad as I, as I look at the impact now. And, and it's just so true. When we looked at lockdowns there, a, a little part of, I guess, all of us thought, is this, is this a bit over the top? Is this really necessary? But I guess when you reflected on what had happened in Wuhan and did China really want this to happen in its other cities, then no. And now that we've seen Italy, Spain, New York, we, we can see that's that's what happens when it uh, when it when it sort of jumps you. So uh, I think you, you I've, I've also used the quote of uh, the world not being ready in, in mindset or or capacity. And uh, 
And I just wonder if we are now, I, I still think most countries are not going to isolate their, their positive cases. Um, sometimes they'll even isolate uh, contacts, but they won't isolate the positive cases. Those are put at home. And, and I just, uh, I don't believe that has worked yet. And I still don't trust 20 year olds with very mild disease. Um, and, uh, and I wouldn't have trusted myself at that age either, I don't think. So, so I think uh, that's a big thing that's missing. And as I, see, as I see the enthusiasm and celebration as people come out of lockdown, I just wonder if, if, we've, if we've still got the, the mindset and the capacity to, to, to deal with this because it's been a tough time for everyone. Um, but we know what happens when a health system gets overwhelmed. Uh, is is the the city can't function, and we know when you uh, were there that uh, China had only had six weeks experience uh, with the disease at that time. Looking back, is there anything you wish you'd probe deeper during the China experience, Bruce? Gosh, that's a great question um, because there are things that we didn't get the answer to, uh, David, and and I think that that's more um, uh, 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 to the point. Um, for, for, for example, one of the questions that I, I, I asked physicians in every single setting I, we went to was, why are some of the young people dropping dead with disease or having such serious disease? Like, okay, we know the issue with elderly people or older people. We know the issues around the comorbidities. Um, and, and you can think through the pathophysiology and what's actually happening. But then we've got these really apparently healthy people who are suddenly getting very, very sick very, very quickly. And um, I probed that in a lot of places. And David, one time when I came out in one interview, somebody asked us, you know, what concerned you most? And what concerned me most was that um, almost every time I dealt with a new disease like this or an evolving situation, you ask physicians, people who are at the cold face of this thing, dealing with patients, you know, what's going on? They have an idea. They have a hunch, right? And people forget in research and trials and the rest, what we're usually doing is testing hunches that come from the first line uh, 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 folks who, who've been seeing this. So I give it a lot of credit. And so we spent a lot of time trying to understand what, what, what are the predictors? And no one had an idea. It's the first time I've ever dealt with physicians who said, I don't know, because physicians will always give you an answer, right? We always think we, we know what's going on. And, um, and so we did probe that a bit. And... Um, you know, I, I, I thought when I left, gosh, you really should have dug that into that more. But I, I, I'm not sure we would have learned any different because I think we're still struggling with that issue. Um, the other issues were around children and how they were affecting transmission or not. And, and we dug into that a fair bit. Um, uh, but, 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 but really, uh, again, coming back, rem remember, just for the audience, when you go into a situation like that, the first thing you got to know is how severe is this disease, right? Because if it is seasonal flu or less, then the world can approach it one way. If it's not, we have to think very, very differently. So we had to get a fix on that. We did fairly quickly. The second big thing around transmissibility, if you're going to do something about it, you need to know how this thing is being transmitted, what are the big drivers of transmission. And again, David, to your point, um, I, we probed the big things. I, yeah, on that point, probably would have dug into the asymptomatic uh, 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 issue a bit further. Um, I felt like we did a fair bit, and we, I, I felt like we got a fix on it relatively quickly. But now, in retrospect, and even while we were there, I remember the Diamond Princess information was starting to come out as well. And, and we could have dug into that perhaps a little bit more. And now, even in China, right, they're finding more asymptomatic disease. So that's a question mark uh, uh, still. But part of the reason, David, and, and, uh, uh, and, and Dale and I and others discussed it at the time, right, the big issue we were interested in was, what are China doing and can that be, be replicated elsewhere, et cetera? And, and this was a whole idea of case finding isolation, et cetera, and, and quarantine. It was like, wow, that can actually work. And if that works, then your asymptomatics, irrespective of the proportion, it's not above a level that prevents you from being able to apply these measures and make it work, right? So we wanted to focus on stopping the disease. So, so that's a, a couple, a co a couple of, of reflections. There, there was one other thing in China that in retrospect, I would have probed a little bit more was um, I wanted to understand really uh, um, the lockdown situation a little bit better because while we were there, you know, the, the, there was basically three cities where there were real lockdowns. Wuhan, you know, people couldn't leave their homes or at most of their apartment blocks, and then two other cities in, in, in Hubei. 
Outside of that, there were many, many cities that had a you know shutdown of many services, and then across the country uh, uh, much. But you know the West is doing shutdowns uh, or lockdowns on a scale and a scope that that is nothing like what was done in China. China had a very, very differentiated approach. I kept hearing this again and again, and Dale will remember in one meeting they were very polite, right? We were talking about this, and it was like, okay, for the fourteenth time, it's not a one size fits all. You have got to tailor it to the risk in an area, to the capacities, et cetera. So China actually had a very nuanced approach. And, you know, this idea of zero cases, sporadic cases, clusters and community transmission, that's how China was approaching it. And they really tuned the machine to that. Whereas in the West, it's been locked down, whereas with them, it was a graduated approach uh, with much, much bigger emphasis on the case finding isolation work. And I think I would have liked to have understood that a little better, mainly to get it to the world more effectively and to the whole. But, you know, I, I kind of public health person. I kind of thought, oh, case finding, you know, case isolation, quarantine, just say it. Everybody gets it. <laughs> and I'm realizing, whoa, they do in the parts of the world I'm used to working in, you know, in Africa and Asia. In the West, wow, this is a whole new language. So I think if, you know, if we probed it a little bit better, mid and able to bring it alive a little bit better, that's another area. We all agree, probably, we all likely agree that uh, social distancing works. How long can be employed without unacceptable impact on uh, a nation's or an individual's psyche? Yeah, so that's going to be context, individual, and person you know, dependent to a certain degree, right, David? Like, um, I find... In Asia, um, probably a slightly longer tolerance than in the West. um, And that is different, again, from what you see in the U.S., for example, where the tolerance is is quite short. Um, Part of that is societal. Part of it is um, uh, also the way um, governments uh, uh, function in these countries and also the availability of your social safety nets affect this uh, as well, right? How do you truly have universal health coverage in a country? Do you have truly social welfare system in a country that can help people both get through the disease and also get through this economically? But I think um, what, what we're, we're seeing is it, it's somewhere in the two, three uh, month uh, uh, um, time frame is kind of the upper bound, David, in almost any environment because of the economic implications and the societal implications. You cannot lock down indefinitely. And that gets to the next point. It is so important to use that team time well. You know, you've got to drive your cases down during that time. You can't just lock down and hope they're going to drift down. You've got to drive down your cases during that time. You've got to build your case isolation, your testing, and your quarantine capacity. Because when you take that extraordinary pressure off the virus, you better have something else there to, 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 to control this thing. And one country I was working with recently, or uh, one environment, uh, David, you know, they asked me to help think about the triggers, right? Like what triggers should cause us to put in, you know, uh, uh, measures back in place. And then I realized uh, that, well, hang on a minute. If you're not doing case finding, isolation and quarantining, then your triggers are going to be extremely low, your thresholds, right? One, two, three cases you want to be alarmed. If you do have those things in place, it's a different game. But I I think from from my perspective, and I've had a chance now, you know, working closely in Spain, a little bit in the U.S. and in China, elsewhere, it's really a couple of months after that. The the concert, you know, that you're getting up to the upper ends of this. And interesting, that's at a societal level, individual level. And some are going to get there much earlier, some much later, right? You see some people going squirrely. You know, my family is bonkers after a day in isolation or quarantine or lockdown, rather. <laughs> it's fascinating. I mean, your 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 points about case finding, isolation, and uh, quarantine. Uh, at the time when you're imposing the lockdown, and that all has to be in place, uh, yet clearly there are countries that aren't doing that, and and, and they're not, I mean, they, they, this is not magic yeah. formula. Uh, when yeah. you advise them, how, how are you able to uh, help guide them in the right direction? What really brings it alive is the numbers. So yeah. if you start talking about, because people sort of forget, if you have 10 cases and you're going to have 10 contacts for each one of those, and you're going to have to call, you know, 
follow them for 14 days, that you're going to be following 100 contacts or, or sorry, cases per day, right? It's not 10 cases, it's 100 because they're going to be in isolation for you know, 14 days or whatever. And then you've got the multiplier on top of that in terms of the, um, of, of the contacts. And so what I've put together is a really simple calculator. So here's how fast your numbers get really, really big. And, and that helps people realize, Oh, my goodness. And it's amazing, right, David? They've been in lockdowns with massive number of cases in um, isolation or sorry, in hospitals. And most people are thinking about that. And if you think about it, uh, take, for example, uh, New York. If, if, if you look at uh, uh, the number of cases they're having that they're testing, finding positive each day, 16 percent of those are in the hospital, right? which means 84% of your virus is out there in the community at home, you hope, self-isolating, you hope, but you better know that. And then if you do a multiplier on that in terms of your, your, your contacts and the number you have to measure, and when you take people's numbers and quickly do the calculations in terms of how much of the risk are you controlling versus how much is wandering around, people start to get it. The other thing I say is, the, 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 the next phase requires this massive mindset shift in, in, in the West in particular. And you've got to shift from thinking about a serious disease and a life-saving operation. So you're trying to find every serious case of this to being a serious virus and a society-saving, uh, saving an economy-saving uh, uh, operation. And, and that's a big mindset shift because in the West, we've been telling people, well, if you think you have COVID, and you're fine, stay home for a few days until you feel better. And we've got to get this big mind shift now. If you think you have COVID, get tested, get isolated, get your contacts uh, you know, identified and under quarantine. So when you start to talk that way, that really helps people you know, bring it alive. And the numbers really help uh, people start to get uh, what, they're, uh, what, what, what they're facing. There's a related issue on that, though, David, that I, I think is, is, is useful um, as, as, as well. And this is this whole issue of, uh, um, uh, you know, people keep thinking about what are the triggers that I'd ever have to go back and do this? And again, you can't think about that without thinking about can you really manage this disease at this scale? Because it is huge. And these skill sets, these capacities, they just don't exist, uh, um, you know, in, in in the West, we're building them super fast. Um, you've been on other missions, obviously, other than China. What were your, uh, and you've alluded to uh, Spain and New York, what were your biggest uh, take home messages from, uh, for instance, your mission to, to Spain? So for, for, for Spain, um, the, the big striking thing for me was just the, and, and, and again, this sounds naive at this point, but remember, I was in Spain nearly two months ago now when I first went in there, but it was the astonishing speed with which these outbreaks could overwhelm a sophisticated Western healthcare system. And David, one of the most striking things I saw was a, a, a diagram in a hospital, the medical director, we were, we were looking at this, and he showed me this diagram, what they'd done. And these are big, sophisticated quaternary care hospitals that, you know, 50 specialties, heart, lung transplant facilities. And what they have done is their control room, they've, they've, they've got a couple of big pieces of paper that show each floor of the building. And you can see every floor, especially turning from whatever it was to red as they became COVID floors. And you could see 11 stories, you, you know, and, 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 and this wonderful physician was just explaining to me, you know, we became a COVID hospital. We became an infectious disease hospital. And, and he said, it wasn't just transforming physically what we had to do. We had to transform our processes because of the IPC issues, obviously. But then he said, we had to transform our workforce. So all of a sudden, we took our pulmonologists, anesthetologists, our infectious disease, and we made them the team heads. And then we took our surgeons and our neurosurgeons and our plastic surgeons, our brain surgeons, and we made them the team members. <laughs> and, you know, so profound. But it was just this astonishing speed which it could overwhelm the system, as well as a primary healthcare system, which was very sophisticated in, in Spain, a wonderful system. So that was the first thing. The second big thing was our scenario planning was still wrong. In the West, we were thinking, okay, how do we get a few more isolation beds? No, what's going to be your isolation wards, your hospitals? You have to think in terms of the scale China did in reconfiguring your health system to manage COVID, not you know, some beds or a ward or some hospitals, it's your system. 
The third big takeaway, uh, uh, and, and again, we've already talked about it and it sounds really boring, but I'm going to go back to it, is lockdowns aren't enough. <laughs> you know, They will slow this, but they're not stopping transmission chains because what you're doing is you're really have, I think of you know, COVID in terms of the reproductive rate in the community, and you're having a big hit on that with your lockdowns. But then the reproductive rate in these closed settings where we know the disease spreads, like in households. And that's just roaring along if you're not doing your case isolation, getting them out of there, and your quarantine. And, you know, the last big takeaway from Spain was you got to use these lockdown periods the way we should have used the, 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 the window we had before it hit us. It, it, was, it was stunning. It was stunning. A lot of the rest of it, though, David, reaffirmed stuff that we saw out of China in terms of disease severity, transmissibility, very similar. And so you're describing graphically what what a sophisticated healthcare system, uh, how it's impacted by, uh, has has been impacted by COVID. David, in 40 years, 40 years of war zones, tsunamis, you know, natural disasters, Zika, Ebola's and everything else, I have never seen something hit a system like this. I, I, I would, I would... I was stunned. And, and Madrid, you know, these great cities of Europe, empty, uh, unbelievable, uh, stunning. So with a country with resources and a relatively healthy economy, what happens to countries that have fragile healthcare systems and maybe not so great economies? How, how in the world can they cope? Well, one of the things that's been fantastic about the role I've been able to play um, in, in this in this outbreak is I've I've got to work with a wide variety of countries, in, in, including some in Africa, the Middle East, elsewhere uh, uh, in Asia that 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 were didn't have as sophisticated systems, and in some of these we're seeing a. a um, we, we, we looked really hard when we saw this thing coming and we said, okay, what's the same, what's different, right? And the first, the demographic is very, very different. When you look at sub-Saharan Africa, 20% of Europe is over 65 years age, 3%, 4% of sub-Saharan Africa is, so different demographic, very different comorbidities, right? High rate of hypertension in sub-Saharan Africa, but cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera, some of the lowest in the world. Um, and then that reminded me back to some of the things that Dale was talking about a lot when we were in China. You know, Dale kept hammering me, what are we doing about um, uh, uh, oxygen? What are we doing about high flow oxygen? You know, Dale drove me nuts talking about that. And I was like, oh, we got to think about ventilators. And then as I, as I looked at, at, at the demographics, comorbidities, et cetera, I, I shifted when I came back. And so we've been talking a lot, like with a couple of countries I'm working with in Africa, is how do you get that, you know, oxygen, high flow oxygen, et cetera, like those kind of interventions may save a lot of lives there because you're just trying to get them through a few days of hypoxia rather than, um, you know, three weeks of, uh, of, of, uh, of the severe lung disease or, or multi-system failure we're seeing. The other things that we looked at is, you know, Ebola, we've had some phenomenal uh, responses in sub-Saharan Africa, as we have for other diseases. When I ran polio eradication, right? The, they would mobilize all of Africa to vaccinate their children. And, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of community structures. There's a lot of church structures, there's a faith, uh, you know, mosque-based, faith-based structures. Um, Africa is used to dealing with big infectious diseases at scale. And so the real thing was then, how do we use what we learned on HIV? How do we learn what we used on community mobilization? How do we learn what we used in Ebola in terms of community isolation, self-isolation, community quarantine? So I've been applying a lot of that uh, as well. So, you know, what frustrated me a lot, David, when I first came back was like, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. It's going to overwhelm these countries and they can't do anything. I mean, what a fatalistic, hopeless attitude, right? These countries can do so much. And what we really were trying to do is how do we take advantage of the chinks in the armor of this virus and the populations it hits to really um, uh, be prepared? And, you know, Africa has done a fabulous job in so many different areas as a result. Great. Thanks. So uh, how can WHO help coordinate the reopening of uh, international borders? Uh, do we have to wait for a vaccine? Um, I, 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 no. I mean, let's, let's work from that worst case scenario that there is no vaccine, right? Um, what are we going to do? Not open borders anymore and all stay at home? No, we, we, we have to find solutions to that. And, you know, I think the single most important thing, if I'm a country and I'm receiving, uh, you know, visitors from another country, the main thing I want to understand is, have you got it under control? Because have you, do you know who your cases are? Do you know who your contacts are? Are they isolated and quarantined? Because again, uh, remember, uh, uh, David, 
people often say, well, WHO never issued any travel restrictions. Hang on a minute. From day one, cases don't move, contacts don't move, right? And it's, it's in the absence of people knowing who their cases are, knowing who their contacts are, having those isolated and quarantined and the rest of it, then countries are putting in place travel restrictions to protect themselves, right? So, um, you know, what WHO can do is, number one, make sure that there's as much transparency as possible in terms of the level of disease control, uh, transmission, et cetera, in different countries, because people have got to be able to see what's happening across the countries, understand the risk. Number two, making sure that the right disease control measures are in place, making sure that that understanding about case isolation, quarantine, is that piece under control? Control. And then as well, using evidence-based measures in terms of any screening of travelers, et cetera, to try and reduce the risk of importations. And of course, one of the most important things we can do is help countries be able to take the best learnings. You know, this big building behind me, which is WHO, it's not a magical building full of all the answers to the world's problems and infectious diseases, right? What it is is a big building where you can bring a lot of smart people together virtually or in person to try and share information and get it out to other countries. And that's the other big thing we can do uh, to, be, to be helping and that, that's why, you know, I, I haven't had a chance to say it, David, but just a huge thanks to, um, you know, Singapore and all the people you know, both there and in the other countries connected, you know, who've shared so much information with us as we've been trying to do this. Even while I was on the ground in, um, in, in, uh, in, um, in China and, you know, shout out to Vernon uh, Lee and his team because I needed some information about viral shedding and the rest. And they had some were just I knew they were working on this. Dale reached back. They shared it with us just fantastic way to work. And, and, and that's part of what's going to help us get borders open, get countries confident, get people being able to move back and forth. Because as public health people, we have a very special job right now. You know, our job is to help societies and economies open safely and being able to operate in the reality of COVID. Our job is not to shut the world down and stop a disease. Our job is, is, is to be able to help the world function and manage with this. And that requires so much information, transparency, and, uh, and communications. And that's the key thing we've got to do, building the evidence base uh, as well. But then not being shy to say when places don't have control, making sure people know that and countries can protect themselves as needed. Can I just jump in on that one? Yep. Uh, uh, you, you acknowledged uh, Vernon Lee. I uh, better acknowledge the others as well. Uh, all yeah, I don't know all the names out there. <laughs> all the NCID people led by, by Yi Sin. They're, they've been uh, very responsive, Sean and, uh, and a lot of the others. The, uh, uh, I remember once, uh, I think it was you or Maria was asking, what is the uh, viral shedding in those with and without uh, oxygen needs. Yeah. And, and they had that back within the same day as well. And the, the fact is uh, often those that uh, didn't require oxygen had, had more viral shedding in, in many cases. So, so this was yeah. uh, crucial information to inform the advice. I, I just wonder, Bruce, we, we touched a little bit before on the triggers for companies. I don't want to take over your job, David, but uh, the <laughs> triggers for com countries. I, I do believe unlinked cases is a really important trigger. Yeah. Um, how, how much do you think uh, WHO can guide countries in those triggers? Because if I was uh, deciding on whether to accept people from another country into my country, I'd, that, that would be my question. How many cases have you got and how many are unlinked? No, that, that's great. And I think, uh, David, if I might, what we've been trying to do, uh, what, what we're finding with the triggers, et cetera, is... Um, there's some that are common and should be available anywhere, and others are going to be really context specific because they run the program differently. They use different uh, uh, um, measures. They, their testing strategies are a little bit different, so you have to tailor it. But uh, one of the big ones, um, in, in fact, just two days ago when I was with a, a country day, I was making exactly that point. Like, um, you've got to have everyone's worried about how much testing are we doing, how much this, how much that. And I said, what you want to know is, what, do you have the capacities you need? Are they performing at the level that you need, meaning you have your performance in indicators? And then finally, are they having the impact that you need? Are more than 80% of your cases coming off your contact list, at least, right? Because that's when you know that you actually understand the disease in, 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 in your uh, uh, communities and should be even higher. So that's one of the key outcomes, Dale, that, that emphasizing, uh, in emphasizing with, uh, with, 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 with folks. 
Um, David, can I just jump in? Because I realize we're going to miss, miss, uh, run out of time in a second. But um, early on in the conversation, I was, I was scrolling some of the uh, questions there. And, 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 and Ed from Indonesia um, throwed in a, que- a question. And Ed, thanks for the question. It was around um, uh, what if, and, and, and I'm sure there's no governments in the world like this, but what if the public doesn't trust the government? You know, how do you, how do you make it work in, in that setting? And, um, you know, this is where, again, Singapore and other countries have done such such a great idea because um, uh, uh, job is, you know, the government has got to figure out who are the key influencers, who do people trust, um, and working with them so that they can work with their communities, right? Every community has people they trust, and those people they trust trust other people, et cetera. And you've got to, you know, it's all part of that community engagement mobilization. You don't do it through a loudspeaker and, and TV ads alone. You got to build, you know, those, those, those human connections. You got to work with the influencers, map out who they are, and you have to really respect them, right? These people may have different views or opinions than you, but they're powerful people with, um, uh, with with well deserved power in, in in many cases, and and you've got to figure out how to work with them. And it was a great great question. Um, Can't just be government. Boom, do this. It, 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 you know, we're looking at behavior change to protect people, societies, economies, the world from COVID, and that requires. It's hard to change behaviors. That requires really being able to uh, um, hear the message from the right people that you trust, and, and then engage. Uh, Compare your professional anxiety you felt at the peak of Ebola with the professional anxiety uh, with uh, COVID-19. You've had many decades of work in this area. What's it like? Wow. Um, Yeah, it's funny. Many people think you just wander into these things after so many, and and it's just, I I get anxious with all of them, quite frankly. Um, You know, there was one difference with Ebola. With Ebola, we were anxious about how do we operationalize our response on the scale that we need to, right? And Ebola, we had to be really creative in the early days. Uh, um, Normally, it's about case finding, contact tracing. That's your big goal, right? In this case, it became about, you know, getting enough beds to isolate and the burials and behavior change. It was the three Bs we started with. And then we got to the Cs around case finding, contact tracing. But, um, you know, we had to take known strategies and, and, and rethink them. But when you're dealing with COVID, you're one step further away, right? Because you got an extra thing to make anxious. This is a new disease. So with Ebola, we knew the disease. We have control measures. It was really how we adapted our, stra- our, our, our tactics to an escalating disease geographically and in a new setting. But COVID, it was a slightly higher level of anxiety <laughs> because, you know, this was Ebola with wings, right? Um, this was uh, was uh, was one that could could move much faster. We didn't know we didn't know the uh, uh, severity of the disease, didn't know the disease spectrum. I mean, so many additional elements. So um, before you asked that question, I thought, well, I get anxious in all of them, and and you know what? I was more anxious with this one. Yeah, yeah. the other one we had, we, had, we you know the other ones we had a couple of anchors in the ground we could work with, right? Whereas this one, man, the whole tent was flapping around at the beginning of it. Um. You've uh, got an uh, international portfolio. Uh, what is uh, what is COVID having uh, in, what impact on pressing health issues such as mass vaccination, the management of chronic disease? Are those just being fantastic question? Hmm? Pardon me. Are they just being left behind, ignored? So 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 again, this was. Um, one of the things I was really impressed with in China when we first went there. It was is interesting. You know, we went there to talk about COVID and, and, and China talked to us about COVID. Um, and then two other big things, I'd say, Dale, we talked about COVID a lot. Everyone we talked to talked about other health services and how they were set up to deliver those. And the third thing that they talked a lot about was mental health. We heard it all the time. And I was amazed. Governors, mayors, doctors who never talk about it usually, um, you know, everyone talked about the mental health issues around, around COVID response in China. And I found that so striking. But they also talked about how we run our health system at the same time. We heard this all the time. They would say, we've got designated hospitals over here for COVID, and these are the clean hospitals where we do the other conditions. And we, do, um, we run our pharmaceutical services this way. We run our remote services this way, uh, et cetera. It was really a technology you know, turbocharged uh, uh, response to do all of those things. And, and I thought that was really impressive. But I didn't pay a lot of attention to it until I went to Spain. And I saw, wow, 
how are people, and, and one of the physicians in Spain said to me, who ran one of these big hospitals I was telling you about, he said, you know, Bruce, where's the pancreatitis gone? Where are the heart attacks gone? Where is the, uh, where are all these other diseases gone? Not to mention, and then when I was in some, some, some maternal and child health, uh, or sorry, primary health care centers, I said, how are you doing antenatal care? And they said, no antenatal checkups, no vaccinations are, are happening. And again, what we've done, you'll see some guidance came out from WHO quite recently, where we're just saying like how you have to run essential services during times of COVID, because if, you know you can deliver, there's a very clever guidance went out by WHO. Uh, uh, and when I say WHO, it's not the clever people in the building behind us. It's drawing on all the people like the ones on this call, but you together put together a nice guide on how to actually do that and do it smart. Because, um, David, one of the other things I've been looking at is excess mortality uh, uh, curves. And, you know, I've looked at these, especially in Europe, where, you know, we put in place excess mortality monitoring in the context of heat waves and then in the context of flu. So there's a lot of good data on excess mortality. These curves, and I, I wish I had one I could just show to the audience. There, go, go on the Spanish uh, uh, response website, and, and there's something called MOMO there. Click on that link and look at their excess mortality curves. They're horrifying. Part of it is COVID, part of it's not. And the Italians are doing some really clever work to try and figure out how much of this is truly COVID, how much of it is not. Because that, David, is starting to put a human cost on the fact that people aren't getting, you know, whether it's vaccines, antenatal care, you know, chest pain and getting managed, getting their NCDs treatments. It's, you're starting to see the numbers. And you know what? It's horrific. So our COVID response, when we call it that, has got to be COVID, health systems, et cetera. Any other uh, final thoughts uh, you have for us, Bruce? Well, I wish I could go through the list of questions because I bet there were a lot of really good ones there, the ones I was scanning. And, and I just want to apologize to those on the call that I've chatted too long about a few big questions and not knocked off a whole bunch of your other ones. But um, we're, 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 you know, my last reflections would be, uh, you know, there's been an extraordinary time in human history and in the history of, of uh, public health in particular. But... Um, I, I think, uh, and, and there's been some extraordinary, we've seen the worst of humanity and, and we've seen the best of humanity. And I think as we go forward, um, we really have got to draw from the best part of it. You know, we're collaborating in, in public and health in a way we never have. We're collaborating across public health and health systems and, and healthcare facilities in a way we never have in the past. And um, this is going to be, we have such an opportunity to move into a golden era for, 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 for health. Um, and, and we really have to use it. And, you know, the reason I wanted to get on this call uh, uh, with you, Dave, was to share a little bit of what we've heard, but also, you know, that plea out to people, you know, we need to go into a new world as we go forward. That's so much more equitable. That's so much more focused on the vulnerable. Um, and that is so much more collaborative and cooperative because what we can do when we work that way is, is simply extra Extraordinary. And that little mission I had, you know, the, the, the privilege to lead back in February and had great people on it like Dale and, and, and others um, just made me see the power of, you know, what those collaborative relationships and Dale, I'm great. You've got the usually have the Gorn uh, role there behind you. It's one of your banners there. Right. These are the kind of collaborations that that are, are just so valuable to how we tackle a disease like this. But, you know, the big problems. We've got lots of other big problems we could be tackling so much more efficiently. So uh, I, I, it's been a horrific outbreak and it will continue to be for some time. People have lost lives, lost loved ones, which is horrific. But um, we've learned so much uh, and we have such an opportunity to shape a very different you know, future as we go forward. Um, so you know, my, my last thoughts would just be how excited I am about the future and, 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 and what we can build on what we've learned. David, there's been a raft of questions we've not dealt with. If it's helpful to come back some point and tackle some other things much more tightly and concisely when I've had a little bit more sleep, um, I'd be delighted. Well, we're, we're happy to have you here. Your last, your last thoughts regarding cooperation internationally and otherwise, uh, I, I hope we continue to hear that. I hope that's trumpeted because that's going to be key to dealing with this in the future. So I want to thank you so much for great. taking time out of your schedule and being sleep deprived and yet being a, a sport and go on with this. So thank you so much. Let me just see if I can summarize, and it won't be a very good job just because we've covered so much ground today, but just try to get down to the, the, the nitty gritty here. We're dealing with an unprecedented, rapid, lethal, underestimated organism. Uh, our understanding of it's still evolving, whether it's Kawasaki-like illness or clotting. 
Um, we live in a world that uh, countries can no longer be silos. They can't draw up their uh, drawbridge. Uh, it affects uh, fragile healthcare systems and, uh, and healthy healthcare systems. Uh, we need to be proactive via international support. Uh, every society needs to identify culturally appropriate solutions to address their psychological consequences of COVID-19. This is for those who were infected, those who cared for them, those who volunteered, those who witnessed, for all of us, we're going to need, we're going to need help going into the future. Uh, and recognition of pandemics as existential threats to mankind and the role of apolitical international organizations play in addressing those pandemics should be uh, the year one curriculum uh, for all world leaders. So, Can I throw uh, in one last one? Absolutely. You know, the other great thing we've learned through this crisis, I should have highlighted, I think it's self-evident always, is um, with the new technologies, the way people are engaging, social media, we have, we can, we can, if, if we can work directly with populations, you know, we're working with the public, the public are involved in this response in an unprecedented way, which is going to be a real challenge to us as public health professionals as we go forward. But, you know, it, it, it's, that's another part of this new era. It's like, they don't want to just receive, they want to be part of solving these problems. And what an opportunity that is to be able to find diseases super fast in the future, to be able to implement measures super fast. But we have got to do everything as we go forward to keep the communities with us, understanding this, designing it, um, uh, because this has been one of the most extraordinary things that I've seen uh, in, in, in this response. So sorry, David, to jump in on a fantastic no, summary. Right. I, I, hadn't, I hammered it a little bit, thanks to Ed from Indonesia, but... Uh, but that's such 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 such, uh, such an amazing problem. My nieces and nephews are so good at COVID and public health. It's absolutely amazing. They're all lawyers and public health and 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 you know policy people. But now they're public health experts. You know we gotta, and I'm sure all of yours are as well. We, we've we've got to grab that interest as we go forward. Great. Thank you again so much. It leaves me uh, to uh, preview next week's speaker, who's uh, Graham McLaren. He's associate professor, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. Uh, National University of Singapore, Senior Consultant, Department of Cardiac, Thoracic, and Vascular Surgery, and Director of the Cardiothoracic Intensive Care Unit, National University Heart Center, Singapore. The title of his talk will be Managing the Critically Ill COVID-19 Patient from Oxygen to ECMO. There's a chat box tool at the bottom of your screen. We would very much appreciate your feedback. The chat box uh, will be open for another 10 minutes or so, and we thank you in advance for uh, your contribution uh, to the chat box. Until next week, stay safe, wash your hands, and join John Mayer, who sang in 2006 that he was waiting for the world to change. Good night. <laughs>